Okay, good morning. Buenos dias a todos. Welcome to the final um, LEA live meeting of the 2021 school year. Um, the weather here in Round Rock is absolutely gorgeous. I hope that it stays gorgeous wherever you're at throughout the state so that you can enjoy the blessed um, Mother's Day weekend should you have any festivities planned. Um, so good morning. Um, we'll go ahead and switch the slide to, to show you our um, great team, great but mighty team, all of us here today this morning. Um, for logistics, it is a webinar format. So ESCs, please go ahead and um, if you're on the, um, you'll switch the slide please. ESCs, if you have your mics on, please go ahead and mute them. Uh, LEAs, uh, go ahead and submit your questions to your ESC contact. If you scroll up in the chat, Carly's done a great job and gave everybody the ESC contact email in case you, you may not have it, um, but feel free to, to chat us and we can get you the right person. Um, follow along on the agenda. There's a link provided here that will likely be dropped in the chat in a second if it hasn't already to um, access the agenda and know that this PowerPoint will also be posted at that same link um, in the middle of next week or so. Thank you, moving on. <clears throat> Under the uh, leadership of our Executive Director of Special Populations, Neelay Gengapadehe, um, the EL Support Division, together with the um, Highly Mobile and At-Risk Division and Gifted and Talented, we make up the Special Populations Division of the TEA. And our mission is to equip school systems to increase awareness and promote equitable access and improve outcomes for all special populations. The EL division's goal, and you likely have seen this slide multiple times, uh, one more slide over, is to increase academic achievement for English learners throughout the state. And we invite each of you to continue along this journey with us. We know that um, together we can make an impact that reaches across the state, and we definitely need your support in doing so. Next slide, please. So I've been in the role a year, Julie Lada, I've been here a year. I was Julie Martinez uh, when I started, but now um, I'm back to my maiden name. I've done a lot of reflection uh, in the course of a year. Um, we've done a lot of the EL division, as I mentioned earlier, Strong But Mighty has accomplished quite a bit of things. And I don't know that the LEAs always get, the, um, always get to know exactly what it is that we're doing. So I figured I would spend a few minutes this morning kind of sharing with you some of the big ticket things that we've done over the course of the year and then um, uh, give you a preview of our plans for the coming year. Uh, the, we'll start with supporting English learners with multiple needs. This is a co collaborative effort between our division region 10 and region 20. And it started with uh, a lit review on how to support um, English learners with multiple needs. And it will result in an interactive resource. So be looking for that soon. Uh, we also, um, we're in the midst of a pandemic and we did all hands on deck COVID response. Uh, everybody in the division and throughout the agency spent, has spent and continue to spend um, many, many hours uh, ensuring that we are providing instructional best practices and specific to our team, um, appropriate EL summer school guidance, reclassification guidance, um, continued collaboration and integration with THL 3.0. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, THL has a website. It's a, uh, online curriculum that the state has is working to provide for free uh, to LEAs who might need it. So lots of collaboration uh, um, across the agency and, and work, uh, tireless work related to COVID-19 pandemic and school closures that the, the division has done. Uh, we're also very excited to kick off our dual language initiative. That began with the dual language guidance committee, which is comprised of 19 practitioners. Um, we have superintendents, executive uh, leadership at LEAs, um, campus leadership and classroom teachers. It's really important for us as we're thinking through what a dual language framework would look like that we uh, capture the experiences and voices of all the different levels of dual language educators. Uh, this dual language initiative will result in enhanced dual language implementation rubric as well as um, accompanying resources. Uh, we are going to pilot some of this work in the fall but very, very soon we will have, we'll be able to present this dual language framework for the state. Um, I think it's one of the first um, in the country. So we're super excited about that. We also continue uh, with the program implementation tools that we have currently. 
uh, we're continuing to promote and um, support the implementation of those as well. Um, that has resulted in some ESC refresher trainer refresher trainings, as well as we took some reflection from the ESC folks and uh, around continuous improvement. So uh, of the of the um, process as well as the uh, rubrics themselves. So we're again always looking for continuous improvement, but also always looking to support the uh, program implementation. So. Um, Another super exciting thing that we've done is we have a newly designed English learner support, uh, EL, I'm sorry, EL web portal, txel.org is our web portal, super sleek. It was a labor of love for Ricky in Region 20, but we've done it and it's great. If you haven't been to texel.org, please go um, visit that website. Everything that we do will be redirected to the website and posted at the website. Um, there's a subscribe button. So I'm gonna have a shameless plug to ask everybody to subscribe to the updates for the web portal if you have not already. Um, <clears throat> and finally, um, but not least at all, the ESL certification online training course uh, that was in collaboration with uh, Region 10. Uh, it also is gonna have an associated preparation manual. And we are excited to say that over 6,000 educators have completed or have over 6,000 courses have been completed. We have been really busy this year <laughs> and we are uh, very blessed um, to be able to work together and, and do um, and create work, work and policy that is needed in the field. Uh, next slide, please. Looking forward to the next school year, uh, I'm, I'm continue to be inspired uh, and motivated by the team that I work with and um, the incredibly passionate bilingual educators and ESL educators that I work with and I engage with, um, and I'm just very excited for the coming year. Uh, one of the, and I've got some things here that, that we're, I'll share with you. The Title III Symposium, I'm gonna plug that a couple of times. Uh, we will plug that a couple of times this morning. Title III Symposium will be free this year. Uh, it is hybrid. We have strands for edu uh, administrators, teachers, and families. Uh, we are working on securing some very exciting and dynamic speakers for the keynote. Super, super excited about the possibilities there. Uh, we're also, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, we will be finalizing the dual, dual language immersion framework. Uh, we are also working on an English learner family empowerment toolkit. Uh, that is, is um, super exciting and, and work that we know is incredibly important. Families of English learners are often marginalized and for a variety of reasons, and we want to help support um, LEAs in, in, the, in empowering that, that particular population, our population. Uh, we're also gonna have some content-based language instruction online courses and resources, stronger, more defined collaboration across uh, other contents and other programs such as special education and early childhood. So we'll be looking for um, resources coming out of that. We also are going to update and revise all program implementation rubrics uh, uh, and tools and resources that they'll be training along with that as well. We have continued support for teacher certification, similar to the ESL uh, online training course. We will have a bilingual um, certification online training course that we are working on in coordination with um, Region 19. So again, um, trying to recognize the needs in the field and um, provide um, adequate support for you all. And then finally, we are going to increase and promote um, biliteracy instruction and ways and, and develop ways and systems that you LEs can um, um, promote and, and advance biliteracy um, in, your, in your district. So that's kind of a really brief overview of what's, what's to come. Uh, they're all at different stages in their development. Um, so if you have any questions about or are interested in any more of those topics, please go ahead and email us or email your ESC and we're happy to um, talk through some of that stuff with you. Uh, it's gonna be exciting here. Okay, Title III Symposium, not the second, it's probably the fourth time I've said it this morning. I'm gonna keep saying Title III Symposium. Please, 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 if you have not already registered, register for it, it is free. It will be held on the 22nd and 23rd. We are, we are getting some information from families. We've sent some, some um, surveys out to families around what the timeframes would be, the most appropriate timeframes for sessions for them. Again, as I mentioned, super exciting um, possibilities of keynote speakers, um, just super excited. So please go ahead and, and help us promote this, this. We really do want to make this the premier um, uh, conference for English learners in the state. We're very excited about it. 
Uh, and then also I didn't want to not, if you can switch to the next slide, I didn't want to, to not mention teacher appreciation, uh, teacher appreciation week, month, teacher appreciation eternity, right? Teachers are definitely, this is definitely the year of the teacher. <clears throat> and imitation is the best form of flattery. And so I was thinking about, we've done in our office a variety of activities around how do we, you know, what, what does teacher appreciation mean to us? We've thought about our own teachers as children, um, thought about our own teaching experiences and, and things of that nature. I would really like to ask you all to think about how you can elevate the status of bilingual and ESL educators in your region and in your LEA. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, imitation is the best form of flattery. And so encouraging them, recognizing something that they, that they do well, some strategy, instructional strategy or, or process or, or um, that they do for English learners or their families and encourage them to apply or, or maybe you uh, submit in, in, in collaboration with them a proposal for at this Title III symposium. If you know that someone is doing something really well um, and we need to share that and, sc and scale that so other people can imitate that. So I think that'd be a great way to elevate the status of the bilingual educators and the ESL educators that you, uh, that you lead and work with. Um, something very, I mean, it would be very exciting. We are very, very excited to, to promote the, um, we really wanna see what teachers are doing. We really wanna share them, share their stories and share their successes on, a, on as large a scale as possible. So please go ahead and encourage them to apply, I'm sorry, to submit a proposal or even better, submit a proposal in collaboration with them. Um, proposals are due on the 21st. However, we are happy to extend that deadline. We really, really want teacher voices. So please pass that on for us. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm almost done talking. Our agenda is pretty packed this morning. We'll have some guest speakers, do some Title III and LPAC updates. Uh, program coordinators will go over some, a couple of myth busters and instructional considerations as you continue to plan for the 21-22 school year. We'll have a couple of announcements and then we'll end with a, about a half an hour or more of Q&A where we will do the roll call of your ESCs. Uh, so please stay with us throughout. And uh, so I will go ahead and introduce uh, panelists. Can you tell me if Dr. Porter is on the call? Um, Julie, I think let's go ahead and go to the here. They're I'm having here. a little, oh, yes. Oh, he got in. Perfect. Okay, great. Yes, go on. Great. So I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Justin Porter, who is the State Director of Special Education Programs, a great colleague of mine, and he and his team are going to share a little bit of information with you all. Um, muy buenos dias. Very nice. Very happy to be here, everyone. Um, uh, this is like old home week for me whenever I get to talk to, to bilingual directors. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Lada and Amy and, and Carly and Sochi for giving us this opportunity to be here today to talk real quickly about um, some uh, an opportunity we have uh, through special the special education department uh, that I think could be uh, of um, of, of interest to y'all. We, as y'all may have heard, we have launched um, an online dyslexia intervention platform and it is, um, we're pretty proud of it. It's pretty nifty. It's, there's nothing like it in the, in the country right now at all. Uh, we've done it in partnership with Amplio Speech uh, and basically the platform contains all of the uh, intervention curriculum within the platform, 100% interactive and housed digitally. Uh, and so then uh, interventionists can work uh, with children remotely or in person, if if you're or blended, if you're doing some of some of both, all um, you can, all of that is possible. But oh, there's Ricky too. Hey, Ricky. Um, but the uh, um, uh, the the most the thing that I'm most excited about most recently is that uh, we have launched the Spanish version of that using the Esperanza. Uh, curriculum that so many of you I'm sure are familiar with um, either through your general ed reading programs or through your uh, or through intervention uh, processes as well because Esperanza as you all know is, is kind of the only game in town uh, when it comes to dyslexia intervention for uh, for students who are learning to read in Spanish and so um, we're, we're super excited about that we have last week Thursday we had a webinar uh, our sort of regular cadence LEA webinar that we have usually with uh, special education directors and um, Amplio Speech came on board and, and gave us sort of a rundown of, of Esperanza and how it works and what it looks like and how to sign up for it. Um, this is completely free of cost um, to LEAs to use, which is probably what I should have led with. 
Um, <laughs> there's, there's no cost involved there at all. Um, the, the, we are also working on, if you have interventionists who need training in the curriculum, obviously they have to have very intensive training in either the English version, which we're using the MTA curriculum, uh, multi, uh, multi-sensory teaching approach, or um, Esperanza, uh, English or Spanish. And for whichever one of those you're going to implement, obviously you have to have the appropriate level of training for the interventionist to do that. Um, but we also were working with um, uh, a regional service center to provide a sort of a centralized hub for that training and it'll be offered at no cost as well and uh, and offered virtually. So there's not any sort of geographic barriers there for folks. So we're trying to make it um, as easy as possible to get into. Uh, again, this is not just an option for um, for times when you are uh, in virtual instruction. This is time. This is can be done face to face as well. There's lots of implications here for teachers who you currently have traveling might, from campus to campus because these intervention staff sometimes have to do that. Um, with a program like this, they might not have to do that as much. Or if they still have to do that, they don't have to slap a giant cart full of all their junk with them every time they go somewhere because it's all housed within the platform online. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, we're super excited about it. I know I talked really fast. That's just my MO. Um, and I would encourage you uh, to click the link on the slide there. I can also drop it into chat uh, for the webinar. Um, I dropped it in there for you, Justin. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, for the webinar, uh, so you can see the webinar has uh, has some several teacher testimonials from a little pilot that we did. Um, and and the teachers just seem to love it. They absolutely seem to love it for lots of reasons, uh, not the least of which is they don't have to schlep all the materials around. Um, but the other part of it is uh, it, it's got built-in progress monitoring that sort of does a lot of that thing. As kids are working independent practice, it's tracking everything they do and providing reports to the interventionist uh, that to save time and make things more efficient. Um, it's also giving you master check information whenever that comes up. All of this is aggregated for the student. Some pretty snazzy reports that you can use then to pull into our meetings or 504 meetings or RTI meetings, whatever you have, what have you, uh, if you're tracking intervention for kids. So um, we are, this is a district level sort of thing. So if your district is interested in participating, they make the contact with Amplio uh, and it talks about that, how to do that in the webinar and, and it just goes directly from there. Uh, it's not necessarily something that we're marketing directly to teachers though. Uh, right now because it really because districts need to be aligned on usually on what they're doing and how they're doing it so that's why it's uh, a requirement that it comes through the district but um, uh, we'd be super excited to um, have a whole bunch of kids in this Esperanza program just because um, uh, for lots of good reasons but like uh, one of the things and I know you all have heard me say this kind of stuff before in my time in a district, I would um, working with students with um, either were who are were identified as uh, with a disability and receiving special education services or not. Um, but you would often hear, "Well, we don't have any intervention in Spanish, so we're just going to give him his intervention in English, and he'll be fine." Well, no, he's not. If he if he needs to learn to read in Spanish, giving him an inter English intervention is not going to be fine. Um, it's it's going to be detrimental to that child. And so this is there's not a barrier there's not a barrier to this anymore. This is free. You don't have to purchase it. Um, you have to get your staff trained and you have to implement it. So, um, you know, again, I, I, I'm not trying to oversimplify it. It's hard to find the staff. I know that. Um, but it's worth the juice is worth the squeeze on that. We know that for sure. So if I can answer any quick questions, I'm happy to. Hey, Justin, just for a second. Can they hear me? <laughs> oh, I'm so, oh, hey, Michelle. I'm sorry. I should have introduced Michelle in the get-go. I didn't know if she actually got in or not. I just went and ran with it. Um, Michelle Reeves is our state dyslexia coordinator. So... Take it away, now, Michelle. I, hey, I just wanted you to know that Steve is actually here and would like to show the demo, and Elsa is on as well for any kind of questions. Well, then why'd you let me talk so long, Michelle? Well, I was You're about to stop go it. Really <laughs> <laughs> Nobody it's wants to interrupt you. It's, it's hard to get a word in edgewise to stop me, especially when I'm excited about something. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, Michelle, you want to go ahead and have... Um... Let's see. Um, I think Steve, do you just need us to share the screen? Uh, he just so needs that to take control, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If, thank you, everybody. My name is Steve Reuter. I'm the director of strategic alliances with Amplio. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And make sure the sound is on. And we will get going. Can everybody see this? Okay, fantastic. Well, Justin's pitch, Dr. Porter's pitch was uh, amazing. I mean, so I don't, I, I'm just going to just jump right into it. Uh, he really encapsulated everything that we've been able to do with this amazing partnership. Um, so that said, I'm going to run through and there'll be time for Q&A after. 
um, as well as um, an abil the ability in that link for you to uh, register your ISD or your ESC and get started on that process. So that said, let's go. So first, this is just a slide from uh, Commissioner Moraf back in March talking about how devastating students with uh, special learning needs are going to take four to five years to catch up. And we're all very aware of that. Um, and how do we address that is one of the things that, that Amplio was able to partner with uh, TEA to ensure that we are going to take a three-pronged approach and follow um, Commissioner Moraf's guidance on getting kids up to speed uh, faster. So this platform has digitized uh, the Esperanza curriculum and it's incredibly rigorous with in intensity. Um, we have the, the data tracking features are remarkable that you're gonna see shortly, but the output and the efficiency is something that you've never seen the likes of. Um, it's using artificial intelligence and uh, also automatic data collection to create pro clinical progress and academic progress faster uh, while making staff more efficient at their intervention. And this is where we come in. So we are doing high intensity individualized intervention while you're able to monitor student progress. So I'm gonna just kind of do a brief overview of, of what uh, Dr. Porter just talked about. The TEA is covering the cost of the platform. So there's unlimited seats as far as number of students that you can enroll. The training on the platform, which Amplio is going to provide the training and then the training on the Esperanza curriculum. And right now we're running through, this is being covered through September of 2023, but we are working uh, with TEA to expend, extend that relationship. And we're just gonna get right into it. Okay, please let me know if you cannot hear this, but here is a, uh, an overview of a, a demo of the platform itself. Amplio is an outcome-driven digital environment that enables high-intensity individualized intervention while monitoring student progress. The platform incorporates evidence-based dyslexia curricula, the Spanish Esperanza curriculum, and the multi-sensory teaching approach curriculum for English. The entire MTA and Esperanza curricula are fully digitized and everything is just a click away. The teacher has planned her lesson ahead of time on the platform. And when she starts the lesson, all of the activities are already loaded into her activity list. We'll show you how easy this is to do in a few minutes. But now we're going to follow along with what the students are seeing on their tablets. This is where the magic happens, on the student's side. Did the video not come up, folks? Yes, we see it. OK, I got, I got the, uh, a note that said the video is supposed to be running. So I apologize. Let me. Let me jump back in. ...while planned her lesson ahead of time on the platform. And when she starts the lesson, all of the activities are already loaded into her activity list. We'll show you how easy this is to do in a few minutes. But now we're going to follow along with what the students are seeing on their tablets. This is where the magic happens, on the student's side. It's where the students practice the skills they're acquiring and are provided with reinforcements, personalized stimuli, and an adaptive curriculum. In this alphabet activity, there's a strip at the top of the student's screen to help them learn the alphabet. All of the objects can be seen by the students and are interactive and multi-sensory. The teacher removes the cover so they can see the order. But then when the teacher assigns the students to begin individual practice, the cover is replaced. Now each student is working in his or her personal workboard. The student drags and places the letters over the rainbow in the correct order. If a letter is placed incorrectly, the teacher can remove it and provide reinforcements so that the student will understand the mistake and continue to practice. They move on to another activity, the reading deck, which the teacher has customized prior to this session. As the teacher flips through the deck, the student names the items. 
In the new information section, the teacher flips a card to introduce a new letter. The students practice in a multi-sensory manner by writing it in the air with their fingers several times. And then they trace the letter on the whiteboard in the platform. Here again, there are several practice opportunities, just like in the Esperanza student workbook. Now, in this reading practice activity, the teacher has assigned the activity for each student, selecting which words or sentences to practice. The student sees the words and begins reading out loud. T, et, fi. As she is reading, the teacher is marking the incorrect responses, though the student can't see that. If the student has read certain words incorrectly, the teacher may have them go back and practice again. Behind the scenes, the Ampio engine is acting as a smart AI-powered measurement and response system, working in tandem with the interventionist to monitor performance and provide reinforcement to the student when necessary. My student loves the platform. She did not use the word interactive, but that is what she was trying to say. No es aburrido. It's not boring. Y me deja escribir. It lets me write. When the session is over, the teacher can assign a fun game for more reinforcement. This further extends instructional time. As home practice can sometimes sí. double net individual practice time and number of repetitions per week. During the game, the student is asked to read specific words or sentences. And when he does so correctly, the student collects a coin and advances to the next level. As you can see, the game automatically pulls that same target word that the student was exposed to during the previous session. The game is powered by artificial intelligence and can automatically individualize itself for the student, according to his or her pace. For the students, this is an ultra-engaging game. If the student misreads the word, he'll get a little help from the platform. Bebe. Now let's jump back to the teacher's point of view. We began by getting right into the session, but I want to show you how easy it is for the teacher to schedule sessions and plan and prepare for her lessons ahead of time. While creating an activity list, the interventionist can see a preview of the activity before adding it to the session. Once she's in the session, she has the instructional script for every activity in the curriculum at the bottom of the screen. It's only a click away. Let's take a deeper look at the student's profile. For every activity and interaction in the platform, whether the student is in class or working in a self-practice mode at home, Ampio saves all the information in the student's profile. This not only saves the teacher valuable time, but creates a record of words read correctly and incorrectly over the course of the entire curriculum. Remember the reading practice the teacher assigned? While the student was reading out loud and the teacher was marking the responses, the system was automatically calculating the number of correct words, accuracy, words correct per minute, repetitions, and total reading time. Likewise, for the intense self-practice sessions like the AI game at home or in a learning lab, the platform is measuring reading fluency and accuracy for each sound, and it's all saved into the student's profile. The student profile can also be accessed by dyslexia coordinators and approved school administrators. In the future, we plan to add additional monitoring tools and deeper dashboards for administrators. These are just a few of the features in the platform, and LEAs that enroll in the program will be fully trained. To sum up, the Core Amplio engine utilizes AI and other technologies to give students more opportunities to practice, more repetitions, continual measurement, feedback, and reinforcement, more intensity, more rigor, more time and instruction, all of which is needed to pave the way for faster progress. I'm going to jump back and continue sharing the PowerPoint. Oops. Excuse me. Now 
Now we have some testimonials from actual interventionists. Is it training and professional development also at no cost? Yes, TEA is covering the cost through the end of 2023, of September, excuse me, of 2023. The main thing is we are able to hear, not everyone's able to hear the video, the testimonials. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Uh, Can you not hear that, folks? No, it's it's slow or lagged. Um, the the sound for some of us it looks like some people. Let, can let hear me shut my video down. down. The the program that we have with Esperanza, where we use the the reading cards and and the kids enjoy something a challenge, something new, you know. And so they're having fun. That it's allowing me to pace my instruction according to the student's needs. That's huge because with students with dyslexia, um, sometimes we have to teach them the reading portion all together and then do the spelling portion together because of the fact that they're dyslexic. So we've, we, we can't make some all. Um, some of the data that has helped me with the AMPLO is for sure the fluency. We've been taking taking in how fast with the uh, words per minute, we're able to find those trouble spots and support them most at where they're most needed. And it's working, you're listening, you're listening to what our kids need, you're listening to what the teachers need, and it's working. It's very easy to use and, um, and it collects that data and graphs it over time, which is really useful too, really helpful. We present the data at our 504 meetings, you know, to parents to show how they're progressing. But on just, you know, a, like a week to week basis, I think it's good to, to see if they are, you know, if their words correct per minute are progressing. And if they're not, I can go back and see, you know, what did, what did they have trouble with? What do we need to go back over? What do we need to work on? So this is a program that has been proven over and over again. The kids have progressed just amazed. The Amplio platform is very similar to the multi-sensory that we have in the classroom. And the students have been reacting uh, very positive. Because I had more than one campus. So instead of carrying all those heavy books with me, I did I did individual, individual lesson plan. And it's like, stack them up for the next day. And now it's like, you click, 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 click. Okay, let's go. So time saving is big, big. It's working for in person because I take my laptop and I turn around and I put it here and then I have the kids with their shields and their mask and their own laptops. And so it's working. And we, I can totally see Amplio even being an extension to their centers where we did this lesson and now I want you to go do independent practice on Amplio with those activities that are related to the actual lesson that I taught. I can totally see that happening. So it's like a reinforcement of self-confidence. They go back into the classroom and they feel better about themselves. They're ready to tackle, <laughs> you know, they're stronger for it. Again, I'm just gonna- this is a great resource. Thank you guys for sharing. Dr. Um, Cardenas Hagen, did you have some brief remarks you wanted to, to uh, share yeah. about the... Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Dr. Porter. And thank you for having us here today. Um, we're very excited to bring this award-winning platform to you. And um, as I just want to thank, you know, Texas Education Agency, Dr. Porter and Mich Michelle Reeves, we are number one in dyslexia in this nation. And we are the first to have the dyslexia laws. We're the first to really make sure we have, you know, qualified uh, specialist. And now we're the first in the world to have something like this for students with dyslexia, but for Spanish speaking students uh, with dyslexia and students who struggle with learning to read. And as you can see, the teachers are uh, able to have that at their fingertips and are able to share the data with their schools, with the parents. And um, we're, 
extremely excited and um, have been having great results with our pilot project. And we look forward. I see a lot of you out there. Thank you for all your uh, kind words. I see them and uh, I'm very excited. It's a dream come true. So thank you. And we'll be ready to serve you. And thank you, TEA. You all are leaders. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Um, Dr. Porter had to hop off and I, I know we were kind of past our time. I just, I appreciate uh, to having the time to be able to present this to you all. I know there were a lot of questions. Um, if you guys could somehow get those to me, I'd be happy to answer those, but I know that we're kind of over our time. <laughs> we will so if, um, gather the questions and we'll be sure okay. and leave your, your contact details in the chat and make sure that everybody has the information that they need a couple of times over. Okay? All right. Great. Awesome. Thank, Thank you all so you much. Bye. Thanks. All right. Okay, well, good morning. I'm going to share a little bit of some Title three updates. Um, and so one of the first thing I want to um, always enjoy sharing this part really as often as I can um, is kind of looking into um, the future as far as our, our funding. And so you can see here on our map um, for Title three um, Part A funds, across the nation as far as the amount that um, we were that we received from USDE going into this next academic year. And, and that is also with an increase in uh, Title III Part A for, all, for the nation. We did see an increase there you can see of 1.27%, uh, which is always great to be able to see that our funds are growing. And it's always better to grow than to actually decrease. Now, going into thinking about Texas, um, you know, we, we received 17% of that. Um, and 95% um, of what's been allocated to Texas um, goes directly, directly to LEAs, okay? So it's based off of a formula, off of your counts. Um, now, 5% of um, those funds do stay um, at the state level, um, which that also is what we use um, for managing the program, um, but then also providing resources and tools. Um, it's also what um, helps um, fund all the resources we have, including um, our web portal. And so, um, like I said, this is always just um, great information for you all to kind of just see as far as where we are as a state uh, with um, Title III Part A federal funds. Now, the next slide, I always like to um, kind of talk about the alignment as far as the funding in relation to the application, the ESSA application. And then on the back end, um, what the compliance report is. And so you can see here for Title III funded LEAs with ELA funds, um, you would have the application schedule um, there for the PS3106. Okay, so that's what you would fill out. And then on the back end, you would um, complete the compliance report of the PR3002. So I always talk about um, the alignment as far as this application, the schedule, and then to the report. Now for LEAs that show a significant increase, okay, of, of immigrant students, y'all would be eligible based off of, a, off of a couple of different methods of additional Title III funds. And that would be our Title III Part A immigrant funds. So you can see there, um, if you are one that's been, um, that is eligible, you would complete the program schedule of 3114. Um, it was also very exciting when we uh, were able to develop the compliance report that we were able to keep um, the same number. So, so it's always going to be um, easy to remember 3114 um, for the schedule and then also the compliance report. Okay, so, um, so those would be the ones that you would complete for Title III. Now, here on this slide, um, I know I always talk when I present or when I have conversations with LEAs, um, I usually always try to give the analogy of, imagine the, the application, um, you know, your program schedules and then the compliance report as like bookends, okay? And the idea is to really kind of support what you're doing in between during that grant period. And so um, the funds come available um, July 1st, and you have the opportunity to expend those funds into the next September. So um, now your supplemental activities that is in between uh, for Title III Part A uh, could vary based off of your needs assessment for your LEA. 
Um, you could be um, funding uh, supplemental staffing or tutoring. Um, it could also be used for instructional materials um, and technology, software, um, whatever those needs are um, for your for English learners in, in your LEA, but then also be able to support um, the family needs. Okay, so um, this graphic here is to really kind of show you um, how they are related, the bookends, but then also really support and um, provide um, you know, that foundation as far as um, anything that you are doing in between um, with supplemental activities, which is, you know, above and beyond. Okay, so um, that's just kind of a glance there. And hopefully that visual kind of shows um, that relationship between the program schedule and that compliance report. Now, I do want to provide an update. Um, we are on the last little bit um, of the the 2021 Title III validation update, you know, um, procedure that we've been doing this year, okay? This was a, a pilot um, year because there was um, some, some shifting as far as um, the procedure and how we were doing it. And so I kind of just wanted to show here in a, in, a, in a chart that we did select this year, there were 42 LEAs selected, okay? Now, out of those, you can see that um, we had three LEAs that were not yet, um, had not yet um, technically satisfied compliance. And not yet is really a key thing because it was not a pass or fail. This was an opportunity for um, TA along with um, the regional ESC to be able to support the LEA to ensure that um, before the grant period ends, that supports were provided to be able to ensure that the LA was able to be in compliant. Now, there were there was another um, engagement piece, the family engagement, but um, the state, we did not select um, that as one of our programmatic questions um, for this validation. And so we focused on parent engagement, community engagement, and then also for districts who generate the immigrant funds, this question was selected from there as well. Now in the findings um, for the conversations around um, the three that were not yet in compliant, um, really spoke to activities that were more general and open to all families um, across the LEA, um, which we know that majority of those, those are gonna usually uh, meet other federal requirements. Or the opportunities um, that they discussed uh, really kind of fell more into parent engagement or family engagement and um, really need to be able to figure out how to transition those into uh, what I consider like the third column for community engagement. Now, what next steps were um, are that there is still communication coming from, um, from me to some of the LEA. So um, some communication has already been sent out and you should have received it. Um, if you are still waiting on um, your closure compliance um, letter, um, do know that that is coming and so those who were not yet um, compliant um, did meet with me uh, and with their ESC um, for a second time to kind of just um, do a follow-up and just kind of see if there was any additional support we could provide. And then documentation um, has been requested to be submitted by um, June 1st. All right, so kind of this is just some general um, guidance and things to consider um, that's gonna benefit everyone uh, who's offering Title III engagement. And one of the first things to consider is um, a needs assessment, you know, to really um, ensure that you have a strong foundation in what you are offering so that you have a, um, a, a clear focus as far as we are doing this, we're offering this for our families um, because we have identified a need. Okay, so just um, make sure that, that there at least is a needs assessment established. And then also um, we have really great um, engagement resources um, that is linked there. And, you know, we have a planning tool. We have some also some one pagers um, for virtual. If you are offering virtual, we also still have examples for face-to-face. -face. Um, we're looking to continue to provide more resources and examples there on that link. Third, um, are your engagement activities offered across all grade bands and not just isolated at certain campuses? Um, that's really great to kind of think about. Um, 
to ensure that no matter where a family lands, as far as their child identified in, um, maybe they're in the elementary, maybe they're in eighth grade, um, do they have access to all three of those engagement opportunities? Um, because if you are doing something really strong and really well at a particular campus, um, explore ways as far as how can you um, technically um, maybe extend that to um, be offered at other campuses, um, or how can you uh, te uh, technically replicate that um, for other campuses um, and use them as a model. And then lastly, the last thing to consider here is to uh, reach out to your ESCs. You know, they are um, there to support you, but they also do fall under a community engagement um, organization to be able to maybe um, provide some resources and supports to your, to your families as far as what is out there um, regionally, um, because maybe there is something that isn't available um, locally in your community, but maybe there's something just down the road a little bit um, that an ESC may be able to um, help connect your families to. So we are coming right off of um, ACIT. Okay, ACIT, um, our spring ACIT um, conference um, just happened. And I know there was a lot of great information and a lot of great guidance that was shared. And there were some things that I did take note and just know that there's, there's a lot more information out there that I, I encourage you to um, to reach out to also the federal programs team, um, Corey Greens, uh, they also have a lot more guidance and information still coming, okay? And so there was a, a TAA letter that was um, disseminated out on April 22nd, um, changes to federal grant regulations. That is a really important TAA letter that you're gonna wanna um, share with your business office if they are not one to, that, um, that receive that. Um, you might want to just send it just in case because there were some changes um, that were made um, and some renumbering of um, some of the policies that's going to be required and that is starting in July 1st. So you definitely want to make sure that the people who need to have that information um, have access to it. Also e-grants, um, they did share that e-grants is going, it's moving to Chrome. All right, so if you are one that um, had been using um, the other, um, you know, Explorer, just know that um, they're saying, go ahead and transition and use Chrome um, so that it actually is, so you don't have any technical issues, okay? Um, ADA and application releases in May, so um, that is still on schedule. Um, I believe that's May 26th. Um, and just know that that is, um, I know it's the kickoff, um, everybody's looking forward to that, and especially entitlement, those planning amounts. Uh, those still have not been posted. I check that daily, sometimes even three times a day. But know that once those get posted to that entitlement page, um, we'll definitely make sure that that is disseminated out to you so that you can go ahead and start looking at uh, what Title III funds uh, were, technically have been planned for you. The additional information here, um, if you'll click again. Um, is talking about ESSER funds, okay? So we have um, ESSER one, two, and three. Now, ESSER three is one that, um, that was recently released, okay? There is some really strong language in there that um, is to help support English learners. You can see there that 20% at a minimum, okay, is supposed to be designated to support that learning loss, especially um, student groups, which, English learners falls under one of those groups. Okay, so um, get with um, whoever you need to um, at your local level to kind of uh, see what, what is the plan. Um, and, you know, especially when you have this additional funds, just know that there's, there's a lot of great um, ways that you can expend those funds to support English learners. TA is working on, um, on the federal program side um, a side-by-side -side of um, the ESSER 1, 2, and 3 um, as far as that alignment. And then there was a, another TAA letter that just came out yesterday um, as far as an update in the fund codes, okay? So that's going to be a very important for you to also share with your business office. Now, NELPA has provided a great um, ESSER guidance resource, okay? Um, and that is really targeting 
um, and focused for English learners. So there's a lot of great information, a lot of great guidance as far as how um, ideas, as far as expending those funds. So just know that um, when, when we take this, any of these type of guidance that's shared across the nation, you still keep in mind that Texas still has other fund source, for example, your bilingual education allotment. So even though there may be some um, examples there, um, always keep that in mind as far as like, maybe that is something that is already being funded with another fund source, but it is a great resource to kind of look at some uh, different ideas um, to how you may be able to expand um, those ESSER three funds. So there were some uh, reminders that was also shared with uh, um, Corey did on April 30th at ACE. Okay, that was Friday. Um, there is a recording, it hasn't been pr um, provided yet. I'm still looking to see when that gets posted, but there were some reminders that he wanted us to, to just know. All right, there is something that um, you have to follow your local policy but there is a, um, that assurance as far as your public notification. How do you let the public know as far as application? All right, so that's just something that you always need to make sure that um, that is still being followed. The next one is talking about grant writing prohibited um, under UGG. So um, Corey definitely stressed that we cannot fund your time and effort in completing the application, the S application, um, or submitting with federal funds, okay? So you can't technically use the funds to get fund, the federal funds, okay? So, um, so just keep that in mind as far as if whoever is completing that, you need to be funding that with another fund source, okay? Then here, I know there's been some questions that's been coming up as far as title three carryover. Right now, there is not any guidance that's been documented that says this kind of guidance. Um, I am looking to add this to our Title III FAQ. But guidance that you do find and see is really talking about um, around other federal programs that does have something stated in statute. So you're going to find more guidance around something that says that you cannot. Um, so here for Title III, we don't have a limitation. Um, there's not a limitation as far as the amount that can be carried over, but it's always strongly encouraged that you exhaust your funds during the grant period it's been awarded because those are the students should be benefiting, right? Now, we do know that there's been carryover and you've had old money, you've had now new money with ESSER and it's getting harder to expend your um, Title III funds. And so just know that for our federal program here for Title III, that there is not a limitation on the amount that can be carried over. And there is carryover that will be applied for your 21-22 no-go. So there are some trainings coming. All right, so one of the ones is the statewide training series. Um, there, there is a calendar of multiple opportunities. Um, and so um, I encourage you to, um, you know, check our uh, TXEO org and calendar. We're going to be updating that with um, dates around the training that really focuses on Title III. Now, there is, a, um, like I said, individualized training opportunities with other federal programs, but just know that there are some um, trainings that Title III will be addressed uh, um, at, in addition with other federal programs. All right. And then also, federal programs is encouraging if you do not um, subscribe to the list of I'm going to get you to go back one more, Carly. Um, subscribe to the list go to receive information because the, the, the trainings that are on the right side with the ESSER training schedule and the live um, Q&A sessions, um, that's going to be very important um, to, to get information, to get updates on that. Uh, when you receive this deck, all of the those one, two, three, four have been hyperlinked. All right. And then lastly, the last slide, sorry, Gary, I get you going back and forth, but the last slide here, you can click one more time. It's just a, um, some places that you can be able to get some um, federal re uh, resources the, uh, our, on our TXEL website under accountability and compliance. There's great resources under that purple box for ESSA report and guidance. And then also always go to our federal programs, district waivers and finance for FAQs.
especially around CARES Act and ESSER guidance, and in our Title III FAQ, um, please continue to reference that as new guidance will be added to it. Thank you. Good morning. So good morning to all 532 people that are on this Zoom call on a Friday morning. So we're just going to give you a quick uh, run through of the 2021 English Learner Summer School requirements. Many of you have uh, read the To the Administrator address letters that have been posted. So we're not really going to go uh, too much into it, but I do wanna provide you just uh, the requirements really quick and uh, some rapid fire takeaways regarding the EO Summer School Program. Remember, we, do not, we cannot change the 120 hours of instruction. What we do have, this school districts have the flexibility to extend the 120 hours during the duration of the following school year. So you, don't, you can start it in the summer if, if your district wants to and continue offering the summer school program during the 2021-2022 school year. Also, another rapid fire takeaway regarding the 2021 EO summer school program is uh, for districts that are offering, that are uh, year round school districts. They don't have to start in the summer. Remember, as long as you have a plan approved by the Board of Trustees, you can offer it however you want to because you are a year round school. So as long as you have a plan, let me say this again, approved by the board, you can offer that program as long as you do meet the 120 hours of instruction. So wanted to let you all know those quick little rapid fires. Uh, and again, you've seen the to the administrator address letters, but uh, think, you know, before we, we move on, those are some of the requirements, the consideration methods that I think Amy will, uh, will talk br briefly about as to how you can implement these 120 hours of instruction. Thank you, Roberto. So we just want to remind you all of this document that Carly has linked in the chat that came out in early April. Our goal was to have everything about summer school in one place. So we have considerations for the various delivery methods that you might be employing, whether it be remote or uh, paper delivery or whatever is going to work best for you this year. Um, in terms of additional resources, we have some other outside sources that you can use um, if you're looking for additional pieces to use. Um, we also have some voices from the field, which is some great feedback we got from some of you all. Thank you for taking the time to give us that information about what worked for you all last year. Last year was very, last summer was very different from the way this summer is going to be, but there may be some tips there as you read through that affirm what you're doing or give you some different ideas. There are also some FAQs then at the end that may have to do with all kinds of things, but our goal was to have everything in one place for you. Another resource that we have for you is regarding the PEANS indicator. When it comes to reimbursements, remember we are a year behind when it comes to reimbursements. So we will be reimbursing school districts for the 2020 summer school program this coming September. I've received many emails as to why have I not received my reimbursement. So this is where I ask you all please to do the three C's come into play, the communication, the coordination and collaboration with your PEANS coordinator, with your bilingual ESL director as to how am I going to implement the program? How am I going to coach the students? It, it takes a whole village as we know that we have a lot of flexibilities. We did the flexibilities last year. We have flexibilities again this year. And remember that, uh, that for uh, the 2020 EO summer school program for LEAs completing uh, that, uh, I, think, I believe uh, the PEANS extended year is August of 26 of this year. Remember, those are for those that continued offering the program during the duration of the school year. There was another PEANS code. And if you already submitted that, then you don't have to worry about that. If you started your program in the summer and finish it in the pro, finish it in the summer. However, if you uh, took a, a advantage of the flexibilities to offer the summer school program during the duration of this school year, then your PEAN submission date is on August 26th of 2021. And then this coming September, we will start reimbursing school districts for last year. Now it is important to look at this very carefully, these PEAN school indicators. Now for the 2021 
you know, do not report summer school indicator code on August the 26th. You do not do this. I think if, if this is pretty self-explanatory and it'll tell you when you should report PEAMS uh, data for the 2021 required English summer school program, which is not going to happen until August 25 of 2022. Please share this uh, brief uh, resource document with your PEAMS coordinators, please. I've been getting a lot of calls as to how they should go ahead and coat the students this year. Uh, and, and this hopefully will explain that as well and provide some clarification. Again, that communication, coordination and collaboration is important as we roll out the summer school program for this coming school year for school year 2021. All right, so just want to highlight a few of the resources that have been updated or released since our last heat again with you at early March. Um, first of all, and I'm actually dropping all of that in the chat right now. First of all, we had um, the end of the year checklist, guidance checklist. Again, the goal here is for you to really have a simplistic way to really organize all of the duties of the LPAC for the end of the year um, and really targeted to what you're doing there as it relates to not only the spring, but then moving into the summer and then the fall to finish up all of those duties at the LPAC. Also, of course, linked here, the updated reclassification criteria, even after our TTN in March, we really thought about a lot of the questions that you had, and we're able to make a few more adjustments to the reclassification criteria chart, um, really adding just some additional specificity, particularly to grade level, et cetera, on the allowances. Um, and also uh, wanted to really highlight that we updated after our last TETN with you, we updated our English learner guidance FAQ. Um, so make sure you take a look at all those uh, questions that said that they were revised or, um, you know, new to the FAQ. Um, and finally, you know, I can talk pretty fast on this piece. We don't have to open it and really go through it because we've also released a brand new uh, English learner reclassification video for this school year. It has been posted this week to the um, TEA Bilingual ESL webpage and it'll be posted on the EL portal. What's new if it's not already there because Region 20 is so fast at adding those things there to the portal. So um, want to highlight that and that YouTube video has been dropped in the chat. A couple of really quick reminders is to note um, that um, it's really important that as LPACs, we, we try our best to get those decisions made here in the spring and not really waiting until the fall. We want to, the, the allowances and the extended timeline is to give breath to, especially when students do need to utilize the allowance of testing lost links if they did not complete uh, all four domains of TELPASS this school year um, and to give extended time for those decisions. But we really wanna do our best to um, complete those in the spring if at all possible. And when not, then we move forward with that extended timeline. Another key reminder is that it's important that we don't make any blanket decisions not to reclassify any students. That's actually noted in that English Learner Guidance FAQ. There's a specific question about that. We want to, um, we're always needing to err on the side of service, right? And we want, we always want to be cautious in any time we reclassify a student to make sure that they are ready. Um, but at the same time, we also want to make sure that for those who have demonstrated that potential for reclassification, that we're giving that, them that opportunity to um, demonstrate that proficiency and be reclassified. Also, another really key reminder here is only administer lost links to those who have a, who, without a completed score for each of the domains of TELPASS. It's not about, oh, we just want to give them another chance because they didn't perform well on TELPASS. No. Uh, we, we only are going to do it for those who didn't have an opportunity to complete all four domains of TELPATH and um, who have also already demonstrated um, a potential for reclassification. Another reminder is that that parent approval is needed for students to actually exit once they've been reclassified. It's the LPAC's decision to reclassify, just like it's the LPAC's decision to identify based on assessments. Um, but we need that parental permission for exit just as we do for um, entry program placement, okay? Lastly, we wanna remember that there is 
for students who, uh, English learners with significant cognitive disabilities who are going through the individualized reclassification process, notice on that reclassification criteria chart for those students um, that there is an alternate English learner reclassification rubric specific to those teachers who are conducting that subjective teacher evaluation for students going through that individualized process, okay? Um, so those are a few reminders about reclassification. And finally, also wanna just mention um, the LPAC suggested forms, um, they're suggested, so you can always alter them, uh, improve them, or you don't have to use them at all, um, these particular forms. But we wanna just note that, and I've dropped the link to that in the chat, um, and keep in mind, all of these resources can be found on our English Learner portal. So if you're having struggles with any of the links that are not popping up for some reason, go to the English Learner portal, especially the What's New page. It has everything really linked right there. So if you're having any difficulty there, and of course, the LPAC portion of the portal. When I recognize the LPAC annual review form has been uh, updated for this school year. So if you haven't taken a look at that, take a look at that revised um, annual review form that remember we're conducting an annual review of all of our English learners, including those with parental denial of services. Also notice here that there's parental notification of reclassification and um, approval of exit or continuation. The LPAC would only recommend continuation, of course, for our students participating in dual language one way or two way programs due to the nature of the goals of the program. But there are specific forms there that you can use that we're communicating that continuation to parents. Also notice uh, that we have there the parental notification of student progress forms um, that you'll be sending out at least by the, the beginning of the, in the fall, beginning of the school year. Just note there that for ELs with a parental denial of services, their, uh, their parents are notified of reclassification in the student progress letter. There is a mark there that you can check that they have met that reclassification, but there's no approval of exit form for those kiddos because they're not exiting anything because they weren't participating. So just notice that when you send that student um, notification on student progress for students with the parental denial that's where you're indicating that they've reclassified and are moving into their years of monitoring. All right, so that was it for the LPAC updates and we're gonna move now into um, our- Really quick, I just, before we, we, we move go on, ahead, uh, I wanna address a few things before we, we go on to the next section. Mm -hmm. Regarding the LPAC updates, please do not wait until the following school year to do your end of the year reclassification. If you can go ahead and start this now, I know that you do, we do have the flexibilities to 60 days, you know, but do not wait. Let me tell you why. Uh, more and more people are getting vaccinated. The economy is gradually picking back up. You might have students that are going to be very highly mobile because now the parents are finding jobs. So they're not going to be enrolled at your school district. They might go to another city and following the jobs. So please, if you have that documentation, just say pending uh, assessments or this child might be uh, uh, reclassified pending X assessment. So do not wait until the following school year and complicate that for that child. It is not fair for that child. I think that child, you know, if you have enough documentation to prove that he or she might be reclassified, at least have an LPAC committee at the end of the school year and do not wait until the beginning of the next school year, please. I do emphasize, I can't emphasize that strongly enough as well. And remember, you do need that parental form for exit. So you do need that. Give them a call, document that in any email. There's various ways to gather that parental approval. So that it's important that you go ahead and please try to reach that as well. Cannot stress this enough with all these flexibilities that we've been uh, offering to LEAs during the pandemic. Communication, coordination, and collaboration is key to the success of our English learners. So please, I just wanted to emphasize that before we, we continue on. All right, thank, thank you so much, Roberto. All right, we wanna spend a few minutes just talking a little bit about some myth busters. So get ready to bust some myths with us. We're gonna address three myths. Um, regarding instruction and implementation. And we hope that these are just some friendly reminders about some key pieces in supporting our English learners across all programs um, and specific here. So 
The first misconception that we're going to uh, bust today has to do with supporting newcomer English learners. Before I continue, I wanna make sure that we recognize, of course, we know not all newcomers are at beginning or intermediate levels of English proficiency. Uh, we have newcomers coming with a wide variety of educational background. Um, and so just keep that in mind. I'm speaking pretty generally about newcomers today. Um, and But we know that this encompasses students coming with a wealth and strength of educational background in their primary language, as well as those with very limited educational background, even in their primary language language, um, including refugees, asylees, etc. right? So this is a large group, um, students with interrupted formal education, etc. But I just want to kind of give that preface. But talking in general, here's the misconception. The best way to support newcomer English learners are with translation devices, language learning software, and peers who can translate. Now, we may not be saying this out loud, but that's our belief, but in our practices, this can be a misconception that's coming out in our practices. So what's the current understanding? Why is this not the most uh, effective? We know that literacy in the primary language supports acquisition of another language. However, methods that focus primarily on translation do not provide the meaningful, authentic practice needed for effective language development. So it's really important to recognize the difference between, for instance, in a bilingual program that dual language instruction different than concurrent translation, right? Or in an ESL program as well, having, um, you know, just someone who's going to sit and translate for the child or even the teacher doing his or her own translation or, uh, you know, utilizing some of the great uh, language learning software, not negating that they can be beneficial, but replacing the student's direct instruction, you know, where they're over, you know, in a separate area while everyone else's instruction and they're doing that language learning software. And it's really supplanting that instruction. You thought supplement not supplant was only about funding. Well, um, it's also about our instructional practices. Um, we want to supplement and not supplant that instruction. So you're going to remember that now every time you see it. Think about it. So practical application here. Just like I said, these should be supplementary support. So for instance, um, you know, software that helps to provide some of those bridges, right, in vocabulary development. And, you know, we want to be able to use, whether it's bilingual dictionaries or Google Translate or some of those other elements as bridges, but not just straight translation of everything, right? Because we don't want... Um, our supplementary supports to cause isolation, again, that student in the corner or another space, and we don't want them to limit that meaningful practice with their peers and engagement directly with the instructor. Also, we want to think about strategic partnering. Think about if you're administering an ESL program, I want you to really think about the beauty of a dual language program, particularly a two-way dual language program. Why is it so successful? There's multiple facets, but one key area is that partnership between that native, let's say Spanish peer, um, a Spanish speaking peer for a Spanish dual language program and an English speaking peer. And how are they gonna coordinate, right? They're going to point and gesture and use simplified language and draw pictures. And they're gonna do everything within their own linguistic repertoires to support each other. We can do that same thing, even in that ESL, ESL, ESL classroom with that, let's say a student at beginning or intermediate levels, instead of just partnering with someone who can translate. It absolutely can be beneficial to have someone who when possible, if you have someone who speaks that primary language of the student, to, to offer support, to have a comfortability in talking out ideas and thinking out, and just like it says in the next bullet there, thinking and sharing their ideas in their primary language, that should be constant, allowable use of them utilizing that. But that's different than just translating everything the teacher just said, right? And so utilizing those as strategic partners, even training the buddies how to support, how to ask their, their partner a question. What do you think the teacher just said? What do you think we're about to do? And really supporting them in that way, train those buddies as well. And finally, really recognizing um, the visual anchors, how the power of visual anchors. I'm dropping the link to what's linked here, a video by Carol Salva, a um, former um, teacher in Spring Branch ISD. This is powerful video to me because it's an English learner himself telling us, uh, when you just tell me it in Spanish, I only know it in Spanish. When you show me a picture or use a visual, now I know it in English. 
And so he's telling us, doesn't it best when we actually ask our students how to support them, right? And what works for them. And so just want to draw attention to that as a resource of what many of you are doing to really support our English learners is those visual anchors and how they can better support than just straight translation um, and anything that would cause isolation without that meaningful practice. All right, Amy, you want to take it away for the next? Sure. Our second myth has to do with bilingual students who um, are also served uh, through special education and the misconception, which I, I hate to even have it on here. I hate, it's hard for me to type this. I wish it could be in like scary font or something, but this is the misconception that I'm sure you guys hear out in the field. If a student's special education services are delivered in English, then he should be in the ESL program instead of bilingual, so he won't get confused. I don't know if you all have been explained this by someone outside of the bilingual ESL uh, division. And this is a misconception out here, right? It's sort of like that myth of more English faster leads to better English achievement, which is false. So the current understanding and what is the students write is that but a bilingual student in any program model receives instruction in both languages. And Carly, this is that current understanding. If you could give me a click, please. Um, the language of special education services, right? Because we don't have that bilingual special ed teacher, the language that special education services are delivered in should not result in limiting access to the bilingual program. So we know that there is a shortage of bilingual teachers and definitely bilingual special ed teachers. And in many, I would say most situations, we have a bilingual student who requires some kind of resource uh, instruction, and we don't have a person certified in special education who can also deliver those services in Spanish. If we do, it's great. Document the heck out of that person because, you know, those kids are going to really, really um, just grow and flower. Um, but sometimes then a well-meaning our committee might say, well, if I'm giving those reading services in, in English, then that kid's going to get confused when they go back into the classroom. And, and we know that that is not the case. Just because they also re receive special education services doesn't mean that linguistically they're also going to be confused. One thing that I think is really critical here is that a particular student's IEP and schedule of services, if they are bilingual and special ed, may not mirror the monolingual peers. As a special education teacher, I know how easy it is to say, well, all of our third graders who need reading intervention, um, who, who qualify for, for reading services, we're just gonna pull them all out at the same time because this is when they all have that. And if we have some that need it in Spanish and some in English, that's inconvenient for us as adults. And that makes it hard on scheduling. However, we gotta put the I in IEP and make those services individualized to the student. So in this practical application, which I will not cover everything in the next, tiny second, but the bilingual teacher, bilingual classroom teacher, and the special education teacher have to collaborate to support the whole child. We know that, but what does that actually mean, right? Well, we know that the full individual evaluation that was administered to the child to, for him to uh, even qualify for special education services included assessments in both languages. So we do have a sense of what that child can do in English and in Spanish. Um, and both of those teachers, can be, should be involved in developing IEP goals. And both teachers need to be involved in that specialized instruction. Now this is outside of the box, but what if I'm a special education teacher who's not bilingual certified? We, there's a couple of students we've put together in a bilingual classroom who need reading and intervention, reading resource instruction in Spanish. Maybe I come in the classroom and work with the class while the bilingual teacher herself pulls those two special ed students and does the lesson that we have created together. That's gonna to require everyone putting their egos at the door and working together for the good of the child. So it's not as easy as what I've just said, but really consider that outside the box collaboration for the benefit of the child. And, and really, I wanna give you all language for when you hear a whole group of people, you're the only one in the room not saying, the kids should just be in ESL because we want to have the languages um, be the same. So really want you all, when you're in that position of having to be that lone advocate, to really have some language and some strategies for how to really serve that student. 
Thank you. And myth number three, the reclassification of English learners in, in a dual language immersion program, one way uh, program, sorry, the misconception that we hear in our programs is some of our ELs participating in our DLI one way program have been reclassified. Therefore, we will have to change program type to DLI two way to reflect both populations of students. And as we know, you know, this is very common out there and I'm sure you've heard it because the current understanding is really following the inceptional, uh, the inception track of the students uh, academic uh, um, participation in the programs. So DLI programs, both one way and two way, both foster bilingualism, biliteracy, bicultural awareness. So that's important and imperative. And what we really wanna make sure is that our students are act actually um, achieving those three goals, whether they're participating in one way or two way. However, in a one-way dual language program from inception are those programs that are serving students that are identified as English learners and only or the majority of them are English learners. And a two-way dual language immersion program serves students that are identified as English learners and LEAs that have the capacity, have the opportunity to extend this opportunity for, and, and they recruit English proficient students and both are participating as early as pre-K and K. So that's based on chapter 89's definition of what a one-way dual language program and a two-way dual language program. And we do know that as soon as a child is reclassified, right, we, we, we change that code uh, for the child. However, one of the greatest things to keep in mind is that in both programs, we want to make sure that we continue to focus on the effective implementation of the program type. This is really going to measure the outcomes and the efficacy of your dual language program that you chose to implement and in some cases, some LEAs, some uh, have both programs running simultaneously, even within the same campus, because of the amount of participating students of English learners and uh, English proficient. However, we also want to make sure that you're tracking your student outcomes, student achievement. How are they doing in that particular program that they started off with, right? So making sure that we're really validating their efforts, we're really validating the fact that they're achieving academic gains in both languages, and therefore reflecting what is the program that really alluded to this success, right? So tracking this child's uh, pre-K all the way to fifth and sixth grade. Therefore, you're also measuring the biliteracy trajectory, whether it was a sequential biliteracy attainment, whether the child was a um, simultaneous biliteracy attainment, depending on the program model. So that's super important to keep that code so that we can not only track the short term achievement, but that we're also cognizant of making sure that we're tracking that long term goal for English learners and for students that are participating in, in dual language spaces. So as we remember that the word from it went from exit to reclassification for the mere fact that we wanted to extend or continue extending those opportunities of developing their first language in dual language programs. So we want to make sure that we encourage the re reclassification to encourage that, that continuity of program participation. So we all know here, right, and I'm preaching to the choir, that the longer that students stay in learning in their first language, the more achievement they will have in both languages and really tapping into that academic achievement and bilingualism and biliteracy. But also in having those in-depth conversations as an LEA gives you the opportunity really to navigate the implementation of both programs and really see how this is going to impact the future of dual language. And what I mean by the future is the possibility of extending dual language to the secondary, right? So the impact of the program is important and the efficacy of that implementation. So if the student started in a one way, you continue coding the child all the way to fifth grade and sixth grade, okay? And of course, in two way, the same thing. So that's myth number three. Thank you. Thank you all for your enthusiasm in the chat. That gives us life. Uh, we're so thankful. And there will be a survey at the end where you can um, give us some, some feedback. Uh, we know you were in the thick of considerations for the 2021-2022 school year. And teacher placement, teacher certification is always a big part of that. So we want to just remind you about some of our resources. And when you get the um, PowerPoint next week, you'll be able to just click right there on resources that's underlined. All of the um, uh, bullets here are located on that same page. So speaking of outside the box thinking, the resources that we're linking here are about bilingual exception and ESL waiver. But we want you to realize that all of those um, 
they are the exception waiver scenario chains, but they really outline the goals of bilingual ESL programs, when they're required, and the appropriate certifications for each. So no matter how experienced you are, there's probably going to be a situation every year where you get a teacher who has a certain characteristics of, of his or her uh, you know what they're qualified to do and then the, their teaching assignment is something that's a little bit different and you don't have that answer right away. These scenario change are the way to go because they really outline all of the possibilities and they will give you in writing what's okay, what's not okay, and what's required. Yes, they're designed to help you know when you need to file an exception or waiver, but they also show when you don't. So we encourage you to really look at this as you are matching up your, as, as you're hiring and as you're matching teachers with um, their assignments. So just a, a few key reminders here in a transitional program. If you have a transitional program, all the teachers in that transitional program must be bilingual certified. It doesn't matter how much, how many English instructional minutes versus Spanish, those cross language connections need to be able to be made at every grade level. And your transitional program should continue from pre-K through fifth grade or sixth if it's housed with your elementary program. So all bilingual certification in all grades. And then, Sochil, you want to talk about dual language? Yes, absolutely. So as we know that in dual language classrooms, it's the same thing. You know, we have, we're serving English learners in this bilingual program. All teachers need to be bilingually certified. However, if you have an opportunity to have a 50-50% of the day provided in uh, English and provided in Spanish when you have those programs typically in third grade and up, then you can then bring in an ESL teacher to then support you in providing that instruction. So it's imperative, right, that both teachers are certified according to the language of instruction for that 50% of the day. Uh, we also want to make sure that we encourage you, right, that uh, as, as we know that e that certification needs to be there, especially like when you're departmentalized, again, making sure that we are very cognizant that the ESL teacher is in partner or paired teaching scenarios so that we can give that equitable amount of time uh, for both educators. Uh, also very important, right, that is uh, this basically for the hiring. I know that a lot of LEAs are in the midst of an uh, allocations and ensuring that they have all those classrooms filled for next year. And especially those that are rolling dual language up into uh, the next year or next uh, maybe secondary making sure that you have those bilingually certified teachers in those spaces. So as you're you know, recruiting, as you're hiring, you know, tap into your HR to ensure that you're really providing that sound guidance to equip your district, right, for the future as well. So that's always very important. Just a quick note about ESL. One uh, important piece to keep in mind that's commonly misunderstood is about our ESL pullout program because it really can be administered in three ways. One, it's really all comes down to who's providing the English language arts and reading instruction, right? Whether that's the classroom teacher who's ELAR and ESL certified, or two, whether you've got an ESL certified teacher who's pushing in to co-teach with that ELAR instructor, or three, an additional, um, whether it's a time period or class or course, um, ELAR time period with a teacher who is both ELAR and ESL certified uh, to provide that additional connected to the ELAR TEKS, right? It's got, it can't just, it can't be like an intervention course. This is not intervention. Uh, it has to actually be grounded in those ELAR TEKS um, and supportive and connected to that ELAR instruction. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, also just want to highlight and, and remind us that as we, this is, these are great resources like Amy Frames. These are uh, really about what is required in the programs. Also in our program implementation rubrics for ESL and transitional bilingual and dual language, we have the program model design and staffing and professional development sections that go into detail about how to grow those programs even beyond basic compliance. Also, if you have questions, does my certificate work for this uh, certification? You wanna check out TAC 231. I've also dropped that right now in the chat. Um, that's where you can know which certificates that you have, whether it qualifies as a bilingual or ESL certification. Okay. All right. Anything else there, ladies? Why I do want to add something to, to this really quick, uh, Carly, is uh, the fact that there's a lot of districts out there that, or we get a lot of calls from teachers saying, well, my district is asking me uh, that the only way that I can be hired is if I'm ESL certified and I do not serve English learners. 
What you see right here are the minimum requirements in order for you to implement the program models. A district can always go above and beyond state requirements. So if they're asking all teachers to be certified, then that is okay. That is up to a district local policy. Great point, Roberto. Thank you for adding that, super important. Um, another just brief uh, comment about, as you prepare for next year and you really think about that strategic scheduling for particularly your ESL at the secondary levels, middle and high school, wanna just bring some distinction between some of the new courses that have been rolling out in the last couple of years. First of all, the ELLA, English, Lang English Learner Language Arts course for both grades seven and eight. It's important to recognize this is a, a optional substitute course um, for the ELAR grade seven and eight. It's a substitute. This is actually the same, that's why they're both in blue, as an ESL one or two, English as Speakers of Other Languages, which is also a substitute for English one or English two respectively, right? So it's important to recognize that those um, courses, they actually are not, um, they don't have requirements on the proficiency level of the English learner who's participating. So you would determine um, what's most appropriate, but recognize you do not have to offer these um, programs, these courses, excuse me, but they are, um, they are substitute courses. So they would not take, you know, grade seven ELAR and ELLA. No, they one or the other. Same as they would not take ESOL one and English one. No, it's one or the other. We don't want to add more courses to where then our, our English learners are really not getting opportunities to be in additional, you know, um, advanced courses, etc. So it's really important to recognize these are substitutes. ELDA, the English Language Development and Acquisition course for high school, is a co-requisite. It must be partnered with either English one or English two or ESOL one or ESOL two. So that's one that would be an additional, which really is more intended for our most recent immigrant students who might be at a beginning or intermediate level of proficiency. That's really the target audience for that course to have that additional supplemental support to the English one, two or ESOL one and two. Keeping in mind though, again, there that they can take that only up to two credits, okay? So I also am going to just, um, drop here in the chat where you can find all of the information for um, those courses. But I want you to recognize, again, these are optional. And also ESL program requirements are based on, are not based on these courses. So it's not about which course they're titled in. What it comes down to is what are the standards outlined in chapter 89, 1210D for those certification requirements. And just like those resources we just went over, the scenario chains, that tells you what those requirements are, whether they're one of these specialized courses or, or not. So just kind of trying to bring some clarity about that. Okay, a couple more pieces. Um, we're gonna just, we wanna just recognize some resources for supporting unaccompanied youth. Um, we have uh, um, some resources that I'm just going to drop here in the chat for you to take a look at at another time. Particularly, we do have our general FAQ, um, our English learner FAQ that does have, you can see on, on the slide here, particular questions that address um, newcomer students that would in, potentially encompass our students um, who are unaccompanied youth. So I'm going to keep that in mind and just bring these resources to your attention. So Jill? Yes, thank you. So also just a quick instructional reminders in regards to how to support unaccompanied youth and all recent immigrants, the asylees, refugees, and SIVE students, you know, making sure that we're really tapping into that effective support of our students. So being mindful of teacher capacity to ensure that they're really delivering the best practices for the students' emotional needs because as we know, some of them have uh, gone through a lot of traumatic experiences just to get here and to get to the campus, you know, that, that they will be served. So being very cognizant of that. So when they're coming in, uh, the appropriate placement, where does the child need to be placed in order for them to be successful? And a lot of the times, um, you know, we want to be mindful, again, of that emotional and, and cultural dissonance of the child. So making sure that if we do those informal interviews, if there's a his history of educational um, uh, experience and tapping into all of that to make that sound decision. If we do have some type of educational experience, what is, what, what is uh, the last school year? What was the, you know, the, the where should the child be placed? And when there is no schooling, 
for those children. You know, think about the age and where is the appropriate grade level based on the child's age, right? And not thinking only of the assessment piece, right? This child is gonna count for us. So again, the grade and program are very important for the child's well-being and academic success. So being mindful of those instructional uh, practices that are going to be uh, done in the classroom and to monitor not only the language acquisition of the child, but also that content attainment. So really making sure that tapping into those uh, uh, strategies that are gonna make content comprehensible that are really going to tap into the linguistic, cognitive and the effective needs of every child. And as you're looking at formative assessments and writing summative assessments to then make that, um, you know, in LPAC making those sound decisions or informed decisions of how to best assess that child. Uh, we just want to give you a, another reminder that we do have a wonderful tool of the five instructional methods for teachers. Even though it says a remote, these five instructional uh, methods, as we know, are effective practices for English learners that are in a hybrid, remote, um, or a face-to-face -face practices. So just a, a friendly reminder. All right, one other just quick um, note is that we actually have a, there, not we, well, it's for all of us, but it was published by the USTE, uh, a new resource um, that was just published in April of this year um, for reopening of schools um, and just has a lot of really good information in it. So drop that link in the chat. Um, keep in mind, you may have to copy and paste those links a little bit and remember all of these resources um, will, you will also have access to them when we post the PowerPoint, you'll be able to click on the pictures and, and everything and open up everything, but the majority of our resources are on our English Learner portal. I just want to draw attention to this nice USDE resource that was recently released. All right, well, as Dr. Lada mentioned, our Title III Virtual Symposium is this coming uh, Thursday, July 22nd and Friday, July 23rd. Again, there's 526 participants on this Zoom call. So I am going to give you all a challenge, all 20 education service centers. If you all can at least try to get three, three proposals each. That way you all can, uh, by next week, hopefully, Go out there, find a dynamic, high energy uh, teachers that are doing great work. How does the LPAC art collaboration look like? How are they implementing the dual language, one way, two way programs? We want to know, showcase the work during Teacher Appreciation Week because we want to hear. And this is a perfect opportunity for us and for you uh, to present and showcase the hard work that your teachers are doing at your service center and at your respective districts. Again, free to sign up. Three ninety nine. Act now. Register now. We have over five hundred uh, people that have already registered, but we would really want that uh, you submit a proposal. So that is a, a challenge for each ESC. Let's see how many of you are well represented at our Title Three Virtual Symposium uh, this uh, Thursday, July, not this on July twenty second and July twenty third. It's Thursday and Friday, two days. All right. So please save those dates. Register today, register today. Do not wait until tomorrow. Hopefully Roberto, I love us. that challenge. I was just gonna uh, sort of uh, piggyback on that challenge. Um, please, there's 521 folks on this call. If you have not already registered, um, we're hoping that by this evening or Monday morning, there'll be over a thousand participants so that everybody in this call has already um, registered. Again, free yeah. registration. Um, some of the, uh, some ideas for proposals I, the, the chat was going off during the Mythbusters, so maybe that's an opportunity for you all to go back into your LEAs and think about um, how we can, or how your LEAs are addressing some of those myths um, uh, and debunking those myths, right? That could be a topic. Other topics that, that were previously, or sessions that were previously presented in years past or around academic um, vocabulary, um, culturally, responses, culturally responsive classrooms or campuses, um, inspiring English learners to be writers, all, all sorts of, of, um, of, of instructional strategies and systems or practices that are happening in LEAs. And as Roberto said, please partner with your teachers. Nothing, nothing is, is more, um, or few things likely, are more um, flattering to a teacher when their campus administrator or district administrator says, hey, I recognize this great work. Let's, let's do it together. Let's submit a proposal together. Again, please, please, please encourage your, LA, your um, teachers to 
to submit proposals. And I love that everybody take three people. That would be great. Let the challenge begin. I know you guys are very competitive out there. <laughs> Thank you all. And there's still a call for student performances. For the, for the sake of time, let's move on. We can get some questions answered. Um, we also have one, leave some time for a couple of surveys for you all. So Amy, you want to go ahead and start the, the question and answer session. Okay, well, how about if we go down to where we have the, are we going to do the surveys, the slide right before this? Poll questions or no? Yeah, I think um, we can go ahead and set up the roll call. There's a, there's a bit.ly there for our um, live meeting survey. There's also, uh, Ricky, if you'll drop in the chat, the bit.ly for the summer school survey. I know there's 504, oh, we're losing people as we speak. Please, please, please stay on and answer these surveys. There's specific information that we're trying to gather related to EL summer school. So if you could please um, uh, answer that if you have time now, uh, we're dropping it in the chat. And also uh, we'll send out a reminder to the ESCs to encourage you all next week once this is posted. Um, to go ahead and, and fill out those, those surveys related to not only the meeting, but also um, the summer school. Okay. Uh, so we're getting down to, we have about right about 15 minutes. So y'all can do the math. There's 20 ESCs. Uh, we are looking at questions from all of the regions. I'm gonna say one question per region if you still have one that has not been answered. Um, our goal is to get ESCs to filter the questions that they would like us to address here and um, so that we can do that for all. Um, if you think that it's a question that you all can answer or that we can email about privately, then, then that's fine too. So keep the time in mind, but let's start with ESC1. Karina, I know you're here. Do you have a question for us? Yes, good morning. We have several, but I chose, I've chosen one. So we know some districts are utilizing or implementing additional day school year, right? So can they stack or not that time and summer school time for incoming kinder incoming first? It should be separate and apart, right? 120 hours from the ADSY? Correct, it should be separate and apart. I know that there is uh, an ADSY manual that the agency is developing and there is a point of contact I will make sure that I share it to you in case you have any additional questions regarding uh, ATSI funding as well. Thank you so it's much. Great meeting. Statutorily required, separate and apart. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. ESC2, Alexis, do you all have any questions for us? Or a question? Hey, Amy, I'm here. Um, no questions, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, ESC3, Cynthia. Good morning. Uh, we were wondering if the ESCs will be able to register for the Amplio webinar as well. That is a good question. I'm, I'm going to assume yes. You know how assumptions go, so don't take that with anything. We'll, what I meant to say is we will gather all of these questions that are in the chat and that made their way to our um, ESC document related to dyslexia and the Amplio services. We'll get those to Michelle so that she can answer them but I would think that they want everybody to be, to be knowledgeable about it, so. Excellent, thank you. We'll pass that on, thanks. Okay, ESC4, Nicole, can you choose one question? <laughs> yes, we do have a bit, but most of them have been answered. Anything that uh, hasn't been, doesn't pertain to what we're doing today. It's just for next year. So okay. thank you, considerations for next year. Okay, great. Um, ESC5, Jennifer, I know you got a team there. Yes, we're so excited. We have um, our directors here today. Nice. Um, and no, it's our first face-to-face. -face. We're so happy. Um, we, I will put the questions in the, um, in the Google Doc. So none okay. right now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh-huh. Uh, ESC6, Christina. Good morning. Um, I just had one question. Uh, let's see. It is, is there an updated availability date on the shelter and instruction courses and the gateway issue? Okay. Platform, but everything else is in the, the Google Doc for you. I can give a little bit of an update on that. Um, we uh, are working internally with the TEA um, communications and instructional design folks 
They're going to be releasing um, soon, we hope uh, before the summer, they'll be releasing the ELPS implementation courses. They're working really just to transport them from the old platform into TEA Learn. Um, and so those will be um, available sooner. Um, I'm actually in the process of redesigning all of the sheltered instruction course material. Um, and that's kind of what uh, Julie was alluding to at the beginning. Um, we're going to be um, working to make those more robust and, and it, under the title of content-based language instruction online course. So be looking for that. Uh, we hope that to be released before the fall um, is our goal. And so ELPS will come a little sooner and, and then the others are, are getting an overhaul. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Region seven, Carmen. Hey, um, I guess I'll ask a summer school question. Um, if they reported their students um, that participated in bilingual summer school 2020 in PEANS in August, do they need to report them again? No, remember there was a to the administrator address letter and there was two submission dates. One submission date was for those districts that started the program in the summer and finished in the summer. And then there was another submission date for those districts that started the program in the summer but are extending the 120 hours during, during the duration of the school year. If they already sent uh, that the PEAMS data, then they do not need to go ahead and enter it come August, the, the, the August deadline that is mentioned. Thank you. Okay, Region A, Anna. Hi, yes, I do have one question and this is regarding the Home Language Survey. And uh, the question is, with more districts requiring parents to complete their child's registration online, can districts keep the original home language survey on file electronically for all students, or does it have to be printed and kept in the student's permanent record? That is a very good question, Anna. And let me just tell you, we do have uh, an answer to that on our frequently asked questions as well. It is a local district decision as long as you do are able to uh, access the, the HLS for that student in case that student happens to, to transfer out of your district onto another one. But it is up to you how you wanna go ahead and file it, whether it's electronic or, or hard copy paper-based. But uh, that question is addressed in our frequently asked questions. Great, so you can send it to them in writing. And I'm so glad we're not saying, do we keep the original or do a new one every year, right? Five years ago, that was our question. We're, we're not there anymore. Region 10, uh, Emma. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Okay, we have a couple of questions, but um, one that I can ask now is how long will the LPAC parent representative option um, will be optional? Is this changing anytime soon? Right now, good morning, Emma. Right now, uh, we are just keeping that flexibility for the reclassification. The agency still has to meet with leadership to see if there's going to be any flexibilities for the following school year. So we will keep you updated. We will let the ESEs know so you can let your respective districts know as well. So right now there's not a definite decision as to what flexibilities are going to occur for the following school year. Thank you. You're welcome. Region nine, I'm so sorry, Javier. I'm, I'm <laughs> things down i can't count to 20 in order no worries no worries thank you for <laughs> taking question? the time so yes uh, this is regards to uh, telpas and lpac uh, when will telpas or if uh, telpas will move to an on-demand data file for early access to results such a star happened this year um, because districts would like to use the information for making those decisions at the end of the year rather than waiting for the summer to do that We'll have to submit that question, Javier, to the TEA assessment division. So make sure that it's in that um, Excel or that workbook, and we'll be sure to get that answered through the um, assessment division. Also, if districts do have particular questions about the TELPASS or STAR assessment for um, English learners, they want to make sure to utilize the TEA student assessment for special populations help desk, um, which can be found on the portal. I'll see if I can drop that link in the chat. Thanks, Carly. They do have Thank a help desk ticket. So any questions regarding to TELPAS, TELPAS alternate or STAR, please, if you go to the Student Assessment Division website, at the bottom right -hand corner, you can click on the help desk ticket to, to ask your question. Okay, Region 11, Melanie. 
Hey guys. Um, so our question is about special provisions. What if a LPAC did not um, complete a special provision on a student during their enrollment in English one or ESOL one, and now that student is a sophomore, junior, um, even senior, can we go back if that student is still eligible and complete that special provision? I think Melanie for this one, uh, we, if you can just ask your question so we can forward it to the student assessment division since they oversee the special provisions for English one and English two EOCs. Right, region 12, Amberly. Hi everybody, no questions today. Y'all absolutely played it, thank you. Awesome. 13, Elisette, do you have something for us? No questions. I think uh, Cody had sent an email earlier this week, so um, there were two questions she sent in. Great. Appreciate that, you guys. Uh, Region 14, Andrea. Good morning. No questions at this time. I think our common questions have already been asked. Awesome. Awesome. 15, Mary. So glad that you're able to be here. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here at the hospital with my dad still, but I was able to connect. Um, as of right now, there's no questions from Region 15. Kind of a scary thing, right? <laughs> you usually have a question or two, so no questions, no questions. But thank you all for all the information and everything. And I was just going to let you know that there is a deadline to opt in for those on-demand um, or for those printed report cards for your CalPass. So make sure y'all know that. And that is on May the 28th. So just to kind of give you heads up on that. Thank you so much. Okay, Region 16, Christy. Hi, good morning. We did not have any questions at this time. All right, thank you. Region thank 16, you. Elda. Good morning, no questions at this time. Okay, 18. Maria. Hi, good morning. No questions at the time. There is one that it's already on the Google Doc. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, 19, Rita. Hello, everyone. Um, I do have one question. Um, because of our dual language program in secondary, can we offer distance learning for Spanish three and four credit since we don't have enough Spanish teachers? This is as a remote class. Uh, yes, Dr. Rocha, uh-huh, virtually. Yes, as long as the students are in that classroom space with a bilingually certified teacher, in this case, a Spanish teacher is providing the SLAR component of your dual language. And if she is content uh, certified and bilingually certified, absolutely. It is a Thank virtual class so and it's permissible by your district, yes. Thank you. Great. Carolina, Region 20, you didn't think we'd get to you, but here we are. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for all the great information. Um, we do have questions. I put them on the Google Sheet. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that most of them are going to be um, needing some collaboration from the assessment division. We have some telepass questions that I put on there, as well as the one that was already asked to Roberto about the special provision. So um, we have no further questions than what's documented there. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. I do want to let you all know, though, if you have any questions regarding to the end of the year, I know that many of you said that there was some uh, links that were not working. Let us know at LPAC at TEA.Texas.gov, please. Or if you I see that you all enjoyed the Mythbusters as well, any other topics regarding Mythbusters, please let us know at the English Learner Support yeah. at TEA.Texas.gov. And remember, the challenge is on. Go ahead and submit a proposal today for the Title III Symposium. Yeah. I think you should be, you're just like a commercial. <laughs> and um, there is, I, uh, with, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, when you get um, access to the PowerPoint next week, you'll see that there are lots of surveys. We have the survey for feedback on this particular meeting. We have feedback on summer school. We have feedback on, there's a poll for what, you know, what do you, um, what other things would you be interested in seeing during this time? So please take a moment um, and we love your feedback and it just makes this time better for all of us. Thank you, Amy. That was almost exactly what I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> please, in, in thinking about how, to, always thinking about continuous improvement and equity and uh, achievement for English learners, we want to be able to provide the best 
resources and information that is timely and relevant to you all. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's been a long time since all of us have been in the classroom. And so we really, really need your feedback, not only on the meeting, but definitely for summer school. We want a better understanding of, of, of a wider range of a wider view of what is happening across the state. It's a massive, beautiful state, but um, we don't, we, we want to really engage LEAs uh, in partnership with our ESCs much more frequently and much more deliberately in the coming um, months. And so the, this information, these surveys are super helpful. We get reports on the surveys and there's 500, 500 800 people sometimes on the call, but maybe only 100 or 150 um, actually um, um, complete the survey. So I really would like to ask you to please, uh, I know it's, it's timely, but they're quick, fast surveys and it really is so that we can better serve you all. Um, and again, thank you for everything that you do for English learners. I hope you have, everybody has a wonderful Mother's Day weekend if, if you are planning that. Um, support your teachers and, and um, thank you all for everything that you all do. Every kid's first teachers are moms. So happy Mother's Day to all of you all. You all are awesome. <laughs>